to probably get a little pop up. And welcome to those of you joining us from YouTube right now as well. So my name is Jamie Vivak and I am the Will County Director for the Conservation Foundation. So welcome to all of you joining us today. Uh, everyone is muted, your cameras are off. So if you're, I don't know, joining us in your pajamas or your favorite hoodie bundled up in a, a blanket because it's so chilly outside, you know, no judgment here. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, as I mentioned, for everyone to enjoy later. You can check out our YouTube channel for all of our past webinars as well. If you have a question, please use that Q&A box. That helps us to see the questions a little bit easier. Um, we will answer questions at the end of the webinar, but as they come to you, feel free to put them up in that Q&A box. If it's something quick and easy like, oh wait, what did she say the name of that tree was? Go ahead and put it in there. I may answer you just in typing just to speed things along, but um, otherwise we will take questions afterwards. For your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in the chat or Andy posts in the chat, but just in case I missed a setting or somebody gets around it, please don't click any links that may show up there other than what we may post. On the TCF side of things, these webinars are offered to the public for free, but we do encourage you to consider a donation or a membership. The more people we have attending, the more it does cost us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you'll be taken to a page with a bunch of resources of things that you might be interested in, including our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help keep us running. Um, if there's a little checkbox in there too, so if you, be, if you check that box, you can become a member, uh, no additional cost, and then you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. And to sweeten the deal, if you've been thinking about becoming a member or thinking about donating, now is the perfect time to do it. We have been given a grant that will match all new donations up to $75,000. And this is good through the end of the year. So uh, any new donation that you make uh, will be matched. So if you donate $25, it's like giving us 50. So it's a great, great time to donate. All right, upcoming webinars, as, as I mentioned, we've been doing these for the past six months already. That's so cool. Um, and we've been doing them once a week um, for a while. So uh, next week on October 7th, how is it October already? But next week, October 7th is going to be beautiful ponds using native plants for color and function in stormwater basins with Bill Bedrosian. Um, Bill is a good friend of the Conservation Foundation, a fantastic restorationist. And if any of you live in a neighborhood, maybe you have um, uh, your homeowners association has a pond or you have a little pond on your property, um, a lot of times people don't know how to manage those. And Bill's gonna talk about using native plants to have that nice buffer around the edge that helps to keep your pond healthy. So that's gonna be awesome. I'm really looking forward to that because I'll be honest, that's a lot of the questions that I get personally um, that I get asked by homeowners associations and municipalities and things like everybody's got these ponds, nobody really knows what to do with them. So um, very excited to see Bill's presentation next week. All right, without further ado, Andy Derrick is a certified arborist and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in forest resources and a Master of Science in Natural Resources, Science and Management, both from the University of Minnesota. For nearly five years, she worked between the Minnesota DNR and the University of Minnesota, coordinating various aspects of the Minnesota Urban Forestry Program. In 2012, she moved to Illinois to work for the Morton Arboretum as an Illinois Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator and collaborated closely with APHIS and IDA. While she was with the Arboretum, she collaborated and authored many publications, including a guide and brochure on emerald ash borer, multiple pest and pathogen fact sheets, several tree tools, the Selecting and Planting Trees Guidebook, the Northern Tree Selector, and the Chicago Wilderness Region Urban, For urban Forest Vulnerability Assessment and Synthesis on Urban Forestry Climate Change Response. That is a mouthful. In 2015, she joined DuPage County as their environmental coordinator for a slightly different adventure. She manages green initiatives, IEPA, land enforcement, works on reuse, recycling, and waste programs, while also continuing to field tree, pest, and pathogen questions. All right, that is quite the CV there, Andy. Welcome, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, one quick thing, I need the screen sharing ability. Oh, 
I thought I turned that on for you. Hang on just a second. <laughs> and while that happens, I like to start out with a couple um, tree jokes. So the first one is, why do trees hate riddles? I and the answer would be because, oh, go ahead, take a guess. Oh, I, I was going to say, why do trees hate riddles? Um, it would be because they, it's easy to get stumped. Oh, very nice. Very nice. And then the, and the second one is, why did the tree get stumped? Why did the tree get stumped? It, it couldn't let go of the root of the problem. Very nice. Good. I like those. All right. Okay. So let's see here. Everyone should be seen. Um, I got to put in presentation and then we are all set. All right. Everyone seeing the main screen? You are good to go. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, um, thank you for having me and for everyone coming online. It's, uh, it's, it's, this is kind of a unique project that we did. Um, and it's really interesting to be able to talk about it because it's very much unlike anything else that I've ever worked on. So I, I, you know, I've worked with several communities and homeowners on small little projects where you, know, you went in, did the project and then you were done. But this is really a multi-phase, um, very tiered approach that we used at DuPage County. And so it's, to me, it's, it's fairly fascinating. So um, I really enjoyed, I and still do enjoy working on it. Um, I work with a fantastic group of people who I'll mention on, um, in, in a little bit here. So uh, one of the things that we're gonna be doing, I saw all the questions and answers coming through there. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to do is, is to initially give you guys a, a little bit of site history just to kind of kick everything off and um, to kind of get you all to why this was an important project for DuPage County. And then I'm going to go through some of the projects, the larger projects that we have done, um, what are some of the differences in there. And then I'm going to get down into some of the, the nittier, grittier stuff, which is what are aspects that um, are really key in thinking about planting trees just in general, no matter whether you're a community or a homeowner, what are some basic things that need, steps that need to take place. And then um, the last couple parts will just be, what did we do? So what are our results from all this? And then finally, what are some resources? And so usually the resources is the part where everyone you know, gets really excited about because I lay out all the funding stuff for that. Um, but not too many people are interested in, in some of the funding streams. So, but that will be available if anyone has questions, of course, too. All right. So the, going through the history of DuPage County. Um, so we're a, the seat of pretty much all of the activity for the government center. You can see um, on the far left of the screen, all of the various uh, departments that we have included in our county. Um, we are located in Wheaton for anyone who doesn't know. And then we actually sit on 202 acres of property. So that also, we also do have the um, fairgrounds, which are over to the east of us. Um, to the south of us is Manchester Road. And then we have County Farm Road, which splits the campus between the east side and the west side. Um, and then we have a railroad track line that runs up along our northern border. And we do have this border right here is pretty much where Winfield is. So we're kind of just tucked in this area. The primary sites I'm going to be talking about are the east campus of DuPage County. But it's also important to know this is where the West Woods is, because I'll mention that a couple times. This is the Child Advocacy Center. It's fairly new and it played a big part into one of our, um, one of our phases of our project. And this is the health department. This is the main administrative building, so the 421. So those key areas are where we focus for our, um, for our, fun, for our different phases of our project. So this gives you an idea of what it looked like. So in 1998, you can see it's fairly typical, um, still a lot of farm fields, a lot of just basic road plans. 
This is the administrative building that I mentioned. Um, this is the health department. You can also see that there is just little dots all surrounding the perimeter of the roads. And that's very common for obviously this time um, of planting. So a lot of people did monoculture and they did along roadways and that was really what was done. So everything else was fairly barren. You can see that there is parking lots um, as well. And then when you look at 2014, you can see the development of those parking lots going away. So we developed the courtyard, we have our judicial center, um, there's the pond um, by the judicial center that is was subdivided and kind of um, played a role in some of the native vegetation. You mentioned basins are gonna be the talk for next week. That would be exactly why everything got started here on campus. So, but the, the thing to draw your attention to is that there really isn't much difference in tree planting for the east side of the campus between 1998 and 2014. Again, you just have small little dots of trees that go along the edges and that's pretty much it. So what does it look like now? Um, 2019, again, not much, except for you notice that a lot of our trees around the perimeter of our roadways are gone. So a lot of that uh, has to do with the trees just maturing out uh, from when they were planted. And then you'll also notice, um, again, you know, not much in the way of new plantings either. You, you just don't see a lot of large mature trees on campus. The picture um, on the right is pretty much what most of our campus looks like. Uh, it's grassy area. So um, our ground crews are kept very busy by mowing. Um, we have, this is along Manchester Road, so you have that shrub border um, that pretty much makes a buffer for it. And you see that quite frequently throughout campus. So this uh, is just, you know, what we were looking at to begin, you know, this program. So we were looking at really old landscaping that hasn't been updated, uh, that was pretty much put in as things were put in with kind of more of an afterthought. We did a lot of building and paving, a lot of changes like that. And a lot of those trees that came out, a good chunk of them were from Emerald Ash Bore. So, we have roughly four large ash trees on campus still, um, but the rest were removed and uh, have been not been replaced until this project. So this gives you a just a reference timeline, and I think there's some key points in this that are that we should really hit. And some of those are the Cool DuPage Resolution and the Chicago Regional Trees Initiative. Um, those actually dovetailed together really nicely um, with the campus tree inventory that was completed. So this really kickstarted a lot of the, the work and preparation for doing large tree plantings on campus. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some of the, the steps that were taken prior to 2015 as well, but this gives you an idea of, of where we're at. So um, we can, I'll, you'll see that North Fern project pop up again, that's our phase one, phase two and three were 2019. Um, those have both been installed. And then we actually have another um, project in 2020 this year, this fall that we'll get going as well. Um, and you'll get all the information about that soon too. So who do I work with inside the Arboretum? Uh, through the impetus of one of the things that I um, didn't mention in the last slide was we had the DuPage Environmental Summit in 2017 where we were able to um, work with the Conservation Foundation and they did a phenomenal job. We were able to um, do a tree-based summit. So it was about the benefits of trees. And that really allowed a group of us to get together and, and there was some demand to start working on these projects. So um, the group of us that inside DuPage County that are kind of behind the scenes with all this, um, we are also the Arboretum Advisory Group, but more commonly known as just the green team amongst people. So um, we do come from various departments. We have uh, Division of Transportation Grounds Management, which is actually now moved under facilities management. So in facilities management, we have um, Jeff Matson, who does all of our mapping and 
um, really is handy with letting us know like what's underground, what are the regulations as far as, you know, path size, things like that, what do we need to consider? Uh, Tim Haldor, who oversees facilities management, he is essentially the supervisor of our, our group and makes sure that we're on task and doing things. Um, there's also Nick Jensen, who is grounds management supervisor, so we work really closely with him, um, especially when we're talking about what are they doing on the ground that might impact where and when we plant. And same thing, Antonio um, Samaco, is, he's been managing most of the, the trees that we have been planting. So those, those people are extremely important to making sure that all of this that we have put in continues on and survives. Um, in stormwater management, uh, Jen Boyer is essentially the, the rock for this group. So she's been there forever and has a lot of the prior projects that built up to this are in a large part due to some of her persistence and knowledge. So um, she's with stormwater management in the wetlands and she is phenomenal with any type of any type of vegetation you have a question about. So she, I work really well with her um, and then I'm in the environmental division. So I do most of the trees and straws. Jen does um, a lot of the vegetation and we um, bounce ideas back off of each other back and forth a lot. So two additional people that I'll just mention really quick again are Angela Lavernier, who's also in stormwater management um, and Joy Hins, who's in environmental division. Both of them are also good sounding boards for us that we've used frequently and have brought up a lot of good ideas and points. So that group together uh, kind of came from everything else that was going on. So the genesis of all of this work is, can be tracked back to one single common denominator and that is the Canadian goose. <laughs> so the Canadian goose obviously create a lot of problems with the ponds that we have, um, also, you know, health hazard. Uh, and so we really sought to try and mitigate a lot of the issues that were <laughs> becoming intensified by the bare vegetation that we had around some of our ponds. So um, through uh, the building and zoning department, we were able to put in place um, some regulations regarding native vegetation. So um, there was any detention pond or basin um, was required to have native vegetation plant around it to mitigate the Canadian goose issue. So, and this also provided a good example, uh, you know, for responsible stormwater management. So that stormwater department has done a lot of work in these areas to, to bring that along. So, but that also laid, paved the way for us to continue to use native vegetation in other areas. So here we have um, the Triangle Garden, which is near our Ducom building. So this is something that Jen put together. Um, and again, just going from the detention basins to these other gardens, you know, that idea of natives being more visually appealing and useful to solve problems really helped pushing everything else forward. This is just one last example. Um, truly a lot of the work that we did comes from, here's a problem, how do we fix it? This is one of those the um, Native Garden Project. It actually, you can see it from the middle of the um, administrative building, we have a glass walkway. And it was, a, it's a huge eyesore. Um, so stormwater worked on creating a Native Garden um, in the entire area and it looks beautiful. So a lot of um, cyclical flowering, uh, plants that are in there that create they create a visual appealing display all year round, which is really nice. Okay, so everything that we've talked about so far has really been vegetation at the ground level, and not a whole lot of work or you know push had been done for anything above the ground. So like I said, back in 2015, after some of these projects were coming in, we joined CRTI as a partner, the Chicago Region Trees Initiative um, that's run out of the Martin Arboretum. Their focus is canopy, increasing urban forestry canopy, sustaining canopy, increasing the vigor and health of our urban forest. So between that and in 2017, with the Conservation Foundation's um, to page environmental summit, we ended up gaining a lot of support and interest in knowing what our canopy was and what our 
what our population was. Where do we sit? So before we take on any type of project looking at increasing canopy in any way, we need to know what we have. So we completed a uh, tree um, inventory. So this was done in 2017. Uh, the West Woods, which is all the green dots that you see um, on the map, that was done by stormwater through a project that was kind of happening at the same time. Um, and then I ended up doing most of the East and West campus. So we were able to take those results, break them down, and look at what do we have in our campus. Um, so pretty much our top five genus made up 77% of our trees on campus. And those would be um, malice, so your apples, crab apples, um, pinus, which are your pines, quercus, your oaks, uh, gladitsia, your honey locusts, and fraxinus, your ash. So remember this is 2017, so we're still taking out ash as we were going. Um, you can see down by the health department, we sell the line of ash trees that um, bordered County Farm and Manchester Road. So most of those trees besides Quercus um, really don't last all that long or look all that great the older they age. So, I mean, pines and crab apples really start to deteriorate after a while, especially in urban conditions. Um, and, you know, Braxton's was taken out by our ash, by the emerald ash borer. And Gladitia, it does well, but it is a very overly used tree in urban areas. And we kind of knew this going in already. So this tree inventory gave us an idea of where we were at, what areas were plantable, as well as where we needed diversity, not just um, diversity of tree by tree species, but also age class diversity. So a lot of our plantings were all done in areas at the same time, which doesn't provide a lot of differentiation in that height or when all the trees decline. So this gave us a lot of room to go to the county board and to um, our department heads and say, look, we, we can put together a plan and, and we can do things here. Um, this is what we're looking at. This is, you know, wh where do you want to start? But what would you like to do? So we were able to come up with uh, a phased approach. So we had um, four different phases. We had the North Berm, um, County Farm Road, which is phase two, the orange. The yellow is phase three, that's the health department. And then um, really, Phase four is the entire interior portion of the county. We haven't done phase four yet. Um, we're still hoping that we can. But this was really focused on where do we have plantable areas and what are the needs and what, what are the most pressing issues that we have on campus. So North Berm, uh, this is a picture going down into um, underneath the railroad bridge on the north side of campus. That's the um, people come in and out of it. It's a main gateway into our county campus. Uh, you can see also the railroad tracks that run along the berm. So this actually gave us a really good chance to try and improve not only some of the issues that we had on campus with the railroad and the noise that was creating, um, but also improve our, our look that we have um, by doing something more, a little, something a little bit more stately along that uh, that path underneath the bridge. So this is just an aerial view of the section that we're working on. So the main thing, one of the main problems that we had that why this all kind of got started for the North Berm first is the Child Advocacy Center was newly built and um, a lot of kids and families go in and out of there and they really want to make sure that the train that comes by a was quieter and B not as visually um, not as visually uh, distracting. So a lot of the work that we did was focused on making sure that we kind of uh, mitigated that as best we could. And one of the best ways to mitigate some of those sights and sounds is through vegetation. So we worked with our um, contractor Ratio, um, who did the specs and the graphics and a lot of our, our initial pricing for us. And they came up with um, some really nice graphics all along the way, but we had a, a lovely um, graphic of essentially what we were going to be doing here. So 
um, over in the, the one area that's by Child Advocacy Center. We really um, intentionally planted that fairly heavily and there's a lot of pines in that area to help with that noise attenuation and buffering um, along with the sight lines, especially during the winter. We also put in cedar. So we have um, eastern red cedar and eastern white cedar both in that area. We have jack pine, we have white pine. Um, we also have a white fir uh, and we also put in some uh, bald cypress too. So, and those bald cypress were not initially planned. <laughs> so I'll tell you about those in a little bit. And then um, areas two, three, and four, it's not a very commonly or heavily used area in the county. So those areas, um, we're able to do some more ecosystem approach. So matching things like oaks and sedges together and creating more of, of that, that combination style, those mini ecosystems um, across that area. So it's, it's a pretty unique, um, plan that we had put in place. These are just pictures of what it was before. Again, nothing was really there. Um, the picture with the cars in it, that this one is by the Child Advocacy Center. So you can see that there's nothing up on that hill. Um, the picture right below it is looking uh, northwards from that same point. So not, not anything impressive. So the question that a lot of people ask is, well, you had this great plan, now how did you do it? Well, we ended up going through a U.S. Forest Service um, grant that was being funded, that was being um, distributed by the Morton Arboretum. So we got $15,000 for tree planting and purchase, and we did a $15,000 match. And so that we were able to cover 61% of our tree planting portion of the project through the grant and the match. Um, it did include the vegetation, but uh, that was that was how we ended up doing it, and it worked out really well. We ended up having um, a three-year uh, maintenance that went along with it, which just ended um, this past year. So this is just a picture of the installation, um, all the trees going in, so shrubs and trees. We did a mix to kind of even the appearance and help with that sound buffer that was going to happen. And this is two years post. So we have, you can see the white pines, um, jack pines, and some of the other shrubs that are in here. And we have the eastern red cedars that are up by the bridge. So, and a, none of these are exceedingly pretty because I, and we're losing most of our good color here, um, or at least right now because of some of the drought issues that we've had. So fortunately, a little sweet gum in the picture didn't turn out so hot, but still hanging in there. Um, and luckily at the same time as we were doing all this, the Westwoods um, DOT was putting a bike path that went to Winfield and they were putting trees, they were able to garner some money to put trees and shrubs along that path. So it's an entire continuous straight shot down all the way down the roadway of trees and shrubs now, which is um, I think really awesome and definitely helps mitigate all the, the mental and um, emotional stimuli that happen when you have that noise and sounds and everything with it. So moving along to two and three. Um, so you might notice the pattern here. We end up getting a problem and then providing a solution based on plantings. Um, so that's one of the ways to really in kind of sneak plantings and everything, but also to make people realize how valuable vegetation in general is as green infrastructure. And I think um, a lot of times we just forget that we can use that and we can fund that very easily through some of these processes. So anytime you have to deal with water, that's a great time to plug in vegetation. And it's, there's so many grants and everything else out there for that, for that type of planting. So this is along County Farm Road, that phase two area. Um, you can see there's, you know, mix, all this is mix of, um, understory vegetation with, you know, the circles being the trees that we were popping in. Um, we did have pre-existing trees there uh, already. They're mainly oak. So we really tried to diversify what else we put out on that front lawn 
Um, so in this case, I mean, we didn't actually put in any oaks on the front lawn because we already had a row of them in the front. Um, so in, we used tulip trees, uh, a lot of, we had some ironwood, some mussel wood, um, Carpinus australia, and then we also did um, a silver bell, which was kind of unique. I've actually never worked with that before. Uh, and then we also put in some red buds and a few other ones. So um, one last thing about this, the, unfortunately we weren't able to fund the entire project. So the vegetation squares, the blocks you see, um, were taken out of it just for cost purposes, but we were able to salvage some of that in a different project. So this gives you an idea. These were all just freshly planted. Uh, this is the um, entrance circle that we did with shrubs. Um, so we did, uh, it's sedges. We have uh, geranium, Solomon seal, nodding wild onion, um, some mount mint, and then we did sour gum and red osier dogwood in here too. So we pulled it farther back than what the initial planting, we, the initial planting that was next to this corner was actually starting to block sight lines and become decrepit. So we pulled that out, moved the circle back to keep with the sight lines, put all of our shrubs and trees towards the back of the circle as well to further prevent any sight line encroachment uh, and then fill the rest in with the, the, the ground vegetation. The other one you see here is um, sweet gum trees that line our health department driveway now. So it used to be crab apples that were all failing. So those have all been replaced with sweet gums. So we did stick with one uniform monoculture along this way, but we also interspersed uh, chokeberry as well, red chokeberry. Um, so that way we have, if something happens to some of the sweet gum, we still have some other vegetation there. So the health department drive, which I mentioned, um, moving into that phase three, which is all around the health department. And again, we had a lot of problems that were kind of that happened in this area. So solutions for vegetation. So this gives you an idea of that um, graphic for that plan. So really looking at increasing the amount of trees that we put along and doubling, um, double stacking back and forth those trees along County Farm and Manchester Road. The other thing that this uh, part of the project did was it also included a really densely populated uh, shrub bed that is, sits right behind our um, health center, our new health center that was built. And this is right along Manchester Road. We still have a shrub border here. You guys saw that picture of all the grass I showed you, the, the shrub border that went along with it. That's the shrub border that is still there. Um, but we're hoping that we can remove it because we have um, this new bed that will grow together, grow in, and, and will create a barrier between any of the patients that use the new health center and Manchester Road. So eventually the plan is to remove that barrier. But one of the reasons why we were able to, re to continue with this whole plan was because we left it in and we were listening to what the needs were for not only the health department, but the people that utilize the health department. So you can see the, the bed, we have the white pine that's right there, the shrub hedge that's behind it. So, I mean, that, that will eventually need to go. It is growing into the, the lines that are above it. And most of it is, you know, a mix of um, shrubby trees, buckthorn, and I think there's some honeysuckle in there too. And then these other pictures are just, again, the, some of the trees we planted. You notice that most of the trees that we did plant were smaller in size. Uh, and this helped with cost, as well as we ended up going with some two and five gallons, as well as some two inch caliper. So we really did look at trying to get some different trees um, for that age diversity class that we wanted as well. So how did the funding through this work? Um, health department paid their own portion of it, and then facilities contributed a good part of the rest. So, and, but this project, we end up did, like I said, scaling back. So um, we were able to shave off some of the costs that was associated with it. But we do have a three-year warranty on 
um, you know, that, that was initially with all this. I think we are now two years on the trees and shrubs, which works well for, you know, when you do your warranty replacements, um, you still have that extra year and you can uh, ensure that any of the dead trees are gonna be replaced and come out still. So additional projects. The grasses that were supposed to go in that phase two underneath the trees in front of the admin building, that those got pulled. However, um, we were still working on trying to get those. So we actually ended up receiving a open lands ComEd grant to do a pollinator mix. So that entire area um, in yellow you'll see is being um, replanted with the pollinator mix. I think it's been adjusted just slightly, but it still is a fairly large area and it will, instead of doing uh, mulch under the trees, it will now be vegetation under the trees. So that's been part of our goal with all this is to reduce the amount of, of mulch or other maintenance aspects um, associated with like cutting around grasses. So doing big blocks instead of smaller chunks helps with that as well. We still do have the maintenance with all of this. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, the next, in the next section. The other project that you, um, if you ever come to campus, you might see is the memorial, um, Veterans Memorial, which is used uh, for public, um, trying to think of my word, public, uh, uh, public observation. Um, I can't think of my words. Anyway, uh, that is used for Arbor, or for Labor Day and uh, Memorial Day for those services. Um, this area had a, was really degrading, had some pathogen problems associated with it. And to be honest, a lot of the shrubs are looking um, not that hot. So we ended up coming up with a new plan that, again, would reduce the amount of work the grounds crew had to maintain it, um, but, and also would provide year, season, year long um, appreciation for it. So uh, we have some red osier dogwoods in there, we have um, New Jersey tea, we have uh, some junipers and sweet fern, um, I think the sweet fern came out because we couldn't source that but um, the fragrant sumac as well. So there are quite a few different things in there that flower and have um, attributes that are different seasonally. So that way it's, it's not just the spring or just the fall for this planting. Okay, so a couple of, so that now we're going to the parts where what did we do with all these plantings and what are some of the important steps? So if you're um, not on a big campus and even at home, these are all steps that you can follow to make sure that you get the best planting possible. So the first one, and I think a lot of people um, step over this, is the soil. The soil is where everything comes from. So if you don't have the soil correct for your tree, it's not going to make it. Uh, it's going to struggle. It might not look that good. It might not put on that much growth. So the soil is where everything starts. So especially on that north berm, we really wanted to make sure that we knew what the soil conditions were because that was an entirely new area that we weren't sure what had been put where. So super cheap, you know, $48 for four soil samples. We got a good idea of, of the pH, um, the salinity, uh, the organic matter, um, the cation exchange capacity, uh, the percolation. So I mean, those aspects are really key when you're picking species to go into these spots. Um, and some of them we forget about occasionally, uh, as in, you know, we maybe forgot the percolation. <laughs> Didn't realize it was quite so bad in some of these spots. So it's always good to do, you know, uh, a brain water test too. If your hole is holding water after a big rain and it doesn't drain within 24 hours, you're in a very waterlogged site. So um, we did have to make some of those adjustments. So we do have uh, the white fur that we had originally had specced for some of the areas we had to take out and put in bald cypress instead and then mound it actually um, to prevent to prevent the um, soil logging that would end up happening with all the water that made that stays in that area after a rain. So it's a reverse seep that 
ended up happening with that. Jen can explain it. I don't quite understand it. <laughs> so the second thing, so besides the soil, so soil is the first. So always think about, even if you are able to dig down, feel the texture of soil, know whether it's clay, sand, or you know a mix, it's really easy. YouTube has tons of um, videos on how to do that. So that, that's such a simple thing to do to make sure that whatever you plant comes out ahead in the first place. The second thing is think about how the site is used. So when we were, like I said, we work really closely with um, grounds and facilities management because they're the ones that are doing the, um, applying all the de-icing salts on campus. And they're also the ones that are doing all the snow plowing. So where they're piling the snow, we don't want to put, we don't want to spend money on vegetation that we know is going to fail there because the salt or um, it's compacted. So understanding where those areas are is really important as well. How do you use your backyard or your front yard? Do you put the icing salt along your driveway or on your sidewalk? Are you trying to put vegetation there? Go for something more salt tolerant if you do. Um, most people aren't gonna have the same salt salinity uh, amounts that we do as a county, but even applying it year after year after year, it doesn't necessarily all leach out or, or fade in your own soil profiles. And you can see evidence of it um, when that happens. So in this case, uh, you can see the dead vegetation um, where we won't get good growth that will come back from that. So we are looking at uh, several species that we can consider putting in here that do well with salt. So the, so one, two, three, three, the third thing, stock type. Are you getting B&B &B container, bare root, which is not as available down here, um, and then even considering ground vegetation, are you doing plugs or seedlings? And I apologize, seeding, seedlings. Um, so B&B &B is gonna be more expensive, it's heavier, you're going to, it's also going to need a longer establishment period before you start seeing more increased growth. Um, container, on the other hand, is going to be a, um, cheaper. You'll actually be able to fix a lot of the root situations that you might have. And then bare root is going to be the cheapest one out of all of them, but they will be the, uh, the hardest to get, especially in this area. They just really don't grow much bare root. So the equipment that you might need for some of these different stock types is, is something to consider as well. What do you need to prep for that? We had a, a skid steer that came in and, and really did a number on our one of our hills because we weren't anticipating it. So pre-planning that um, is, a, is a lesson learned for us. Always check your stock as well, no matter whether you get it in on site or if you are um, a homeowner and you're getting delivered. If you haven't gone and tagged it yourself, you have the chance to still reject it in most cases. So, um, you know, look, look at the, the stem, look at the leader, look at the branches. Are there any, um, any fungal or pathogen issues on it? Also look at the soil, kind of dig around, look at the formation of the root. Um, we have a club root on the, one of the bottom pictures there. So that really tells you that, that how that root is gonna grow is not gonna be very successful. We don't always catch all of it either. So the roots that you do see, sometimes they do end up getting planted and it's not really all that, um, all that useful sometimes to always find everything. But we do try as best we can with it. Also maintaining your site, so weeding is important, especially once you actually put everything in. Um, and then making sure you water it too. You saw a lot of the, the gator bags that we had and those are such a, a great purchase. As a homeowner, as someone that's planting a bunch of trees in a um, park or you know on a campus, you can't go wrong with it. Especially with the droughts that we've been having in the summer, we, um, our gator bags were delayed in being purchased and sent and it really took out a couple of trees that we did have initially in there. So long-term care, um, especially when you're talking about holistic approach for an urban forest, you're thinking about pruning, starting a pruning cycle. So we just did the first prunings that 
most of the folks I work with on campus had ever seen, uh, the most thorough one. Um, so we're planning to continue that every five to seven years. The derecho that came through, it was probably one of the first times where we did not have a tree come down, nor did we have major branches come down either. So we weren't, you know, we're still affected by those super high intense winds. And because we're rather open, it really did come whistling through our campus. However, um, very little, uh, very little down trees as a result. We had, we had none. So I mentioned that watering those gator bags are highly worth it. Um, and then the, the maintenance of your native areas, so your, your um, native vegetation. So we do have an on-call contractor that we use for our ground cover areas, and this is slightly different than the native garden. There's a separate contract for that, contractor for that, and how those two are managed is different because the garden obviously would be a fall cleanup, some plant replacements and other things. And the ground cover areas, we're mainly looking at mowing, herbicide, or fire for management. Um, the initial years that you put so that you do all of this is going to be pretty intensive. You're not you're not really going to see any cost savings. But the idea is the further we get down the road, we will begin to um, actualize a lot of those cost savings from not mowing all that area or putting mulch down in these areas either. So what did what do we get out of all this? One of the things that we were able to get out of this was um, some recognition. So we did apply for uh, the ARBnet um, Arboretum level. So we got a level one. And what it also did was it, it solidified our commitment to the things that you see, diversity, maintenance, ownership, long-term planning and responsibility. So it, it solidified our, not just putting in trees, but caring for those trees for the long haul. Um, we actually are going to be trying to go to a level two here. We are supposed to have it have it, our application um, done this spring, but COVID happened. So as most of us are going through, uh, plans changed. So this one is a little bit hard to see, and I and I don't know. At this point, I just didn't have a better way to kind of do it. But the picture, the smaller picture um, on the bottom. Uh, right is our old inventory from 2017. The larger one is um, the new inventory. So the darker the the marker, the newer the tree. So it's newly planted, it's smaller, um, which is why. So you can see all those darker greens on the east side of campus uh, are are all tucked in there. And we actually, it's not just in the main phase areas that we had. You can also see some of them in the courtyard too. And those come from some other areas, not our main projects. So they actually came from the DuPage Forest Preserve. Um, they have a nursery and they offered some of their stock to us as well too. So we're able to intersperse some of their stock and some of our, our phases where we know we're going to be putting trees but just don't have the funding to do the complete run of it yet. So we underplant some of the trees to kind of get some, some growth in there to create that diversity that we'll need um, once we finish. So they've been a fantastic partner. I mean, this past year we put in 81 trees, 25 shrubs. So it's, it adds up. It adds up to a lot. The Arbor Day estimates is the other thing that we've been doing, and this is a good one for anyone that might um you know be looking if they have a larger yard maybe you know half acre to an acre um we receive we do a tree seedling giveaway every year um for our birthday we receive our seedlings from the dnr nursery um mason state nursery and they now offer them in bundles of 25. so they're seedlings so you're talking really short and small but um Several of our staff that have been planting them out every year or have received them send us pictures back and tell us how they're doing. So it's one of the ways that we are not only improving our county campus, but we're also improving DuPage as a whole, DuPage County. So a lot of these trees are going back into people's yards. Um, and the other nice thing is this past year, 
we weren't able to hand those out due to COVID. But however, we were able to hand them, we had about 300 trees that um, seedlings that we were able to disperse between park districts and some municipal governments in the area. And so that's a really another neat feature that we know that those trees are going to be going out, increasing the urban forest at some point across DuPage County as well. Um, so I just, as I, you know, this is not a complete total, but you know, we pretty much guessed with the Arbor Day trees, probably about 25% mortality rate. So you're still looking at us having put in DuPage County campus, 577 trees and shrubs just in the past three years. So we're pretty proud of that. We, we think it's kind of a neat thing. Um, and a lot of the extra, those Arbor Day estimates, those are extra trees that we had from our um, from our events. So those usually would go out into the West Woods and underplant, uh, understory in the West Woods, and we'd match up the species. All, all of the, all the trees that we planted in this, all of this are, we go for native species. So they all work um, in these areas. Diversity. Uh, this was a big one everyone had the question on. So again, we use native plants in our diversity. So on the one side, you have the list of tree species that we planted, but were already found on campus. So we already had northern pin oak, we already had bur oak, swamp white oak, red oak. You know, we we had those trees on campus already. Um, but this is just putting in more in in various areas. So a lot of our oaks went over to the health department, to the courtyard, and along the berm. Again, not much went along. County Farm Road because we already had oaks that were planted there um, by another employee. So the diversity that we added, uh, again, this doesn't include the shrubs, but I mean, we put in sour gum, we put in mussel wood, we put in Dakota dogwood, Canadian red cherry, tulip tree, buckeye, we put in hybrid elms. That one was a little bit of a, a struggle to get through everyone to get on board with, but yeah, we'll, we're kind of excited to see um, what they do. The shagbark hickory, we did white fir, the bitternut, you know, catalpa, all these things. The one that's not on here is the bald cypress. So a lot of diversity that we added to campus just by doing these various projects. Um, and especially with the oak, you know, going through and adding different oak was really important to us. I, I have always come from the education of the the 30 20 10 rule, which is no more than 30% of one family, no more than 20% of one genus, no more than 10% of one species. Um, and that's, that's how you should go through the diversity aspect for planning out. Um, I know that there are, you know, um, Lydia Scott at the Arboretum has developed a different philosophy, but I think either way, just knowing what you have and changing it out uh, helps. Okay, um, we have five minutes left. I'm gonna roll through just some of these resources. I can make these available however people are interested as, as well. So just online resources. Uh, the Arboretum has their tree selector. It's a great tool. Um, will allow you to kind of look at your site and what's possible there. It has all the different buttons you can play with for you know amount of shade, sunlight, um, salinity, pH, things like that. The other one that I will point out, I don't think a lot of people know about this one. Um, it's the Chicago rti.org slash nursery tree inventory. If you're looking for native plants, they have an inventory of, um, they talk to nurseries in, in the state and they provide an inventory of what they have for native stock. It's not always up to date, but it's a really good indicator of what nurseries have carry native plants and what types of native plants. So I use this actually pretty frequently when I'm sourcing for material. Funding. You have all these options for funding. Um, the, the top ones are really some of the main ones for tree planting, um, but you also have, you know, stormwater is such a big part of, you know, problem solving and doing vegetation with that. So there's a lot of options that you have with trying to source out some funding. Um, the biggest thing though is thinking outside the box. So if you're a community or, or you work with a nonprofit or something like that, Look at the corporations that are in your area, the, the rail yard, the, the major um, 
utility and see what they have in their giving programs because we find a lot of funding that we can kind of source out of that. As a government entity, we can't really go after that, but if you're a nonprofit or a community group, you have the access to go through that. Um, so there's a lot of those out there all across the state, and sometimes they're just looking for those types of projects that are good PR ones, too. So last couple of things, um, tree, owners, tree owners, mineral, and the Healthy Hedges. Uh, these are good resources I think some people don't know about as well. So the Healthy Hedge Initiative um, is out of the Arboretum and had a bunch of other partners. Uh, CRTI was a main partner with that one. Um, and again, if you have buckthorn, this is a great resource for options to replace. And they even have one for varying heights and how to do that. All right. so. Key thing to all this, trees grow slow. They grow really, really slow. Uh, you're planting for the future. I mean, you just have to remember that. So it's, plug them in as you go. It'll never be too late. The, you know, there's the quote about the, the tree that never got planted was the one that got planted too late. So, you know, just, just to go out there and, and get some trees in the ground and, you're planting for the future, and that's that's what all this is about. So you're creating your urban forest for the future. Okay. Whew. Thanks, you guys, for sticking with me. <laughs> I think one of my favorite tree maxims is the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Yes. All right. We have a couple of questions here. And let's see. Oh, first... Sandra asked, could you repeat that 30-20-10 rule? So 30%, um, no more than 30% of a family, no more than 20% of a genus, and no more than 10% of a species. So when you're thinking about what you want to put in, kind of go by that. So if you already have 10% of swamp white oak, you can add, you know, some more oak, but just from a different um, species. And then once you hit that 20% of oak, then you should go outside to a different family, so not a Quercus-based family, to add in more diversity. So that means you've got to know, you have to what have you your have. tree inventory done, and then you can sort of divide it out and see where everything falls in there too. Yes, Perfect. Exactly. Sarah wants to know, does DuPage County have a planning department? Have you worked with them? So planning department, as in <laughs> we have a stormwater department, I'm in building and zoning, which also houses the environmental division. Um, we don't necessarily have like a, a planning department. It's all of us kind of work interchangeably together. Um, they might have had one a couple years ago under a different name, I, that I don't know, but um, we, all kind of work together to create these different types of plans. So, well, that's kind of good too when you've got a lot of people working together to to do that. Um, I wanted to throw in there too, Stephen had asked if he could get a copy of the slides. I generally don't send out the whole presentation afterwards because it's really big and it's kind of hard to do. But as I mentioned in the beginning, these webinars are recorded. I get them up on our YouTube channel generally within a couple hours. You know, it depends on how my upload speed's going at the time, but, um, it, you know, always within 24 hours, they're up on our, on that YouTube channel. So you're welcome to go back and rewatch them as many times as you would like and send the links to your friends. Um, and I will send you though, however, the, the resources um, and the funding graphic for sure. So you can send perfect. that out. Yeah, and I know um, for that Healthy Hedges Guide, the Morton Arboretum does have that on their website as a downloadable PDF. So if you go to the Arboretum's website, um, you can download a really nice copy of that. I send that out to people all the time. All right, uh, Sandra wants to know, can people walk at the DuPage County campus and it's the sites you talked about? Yes. Um, we are actually working on coming up with a map um, for our arboretum status. We had to have specific specimen trees. Uh, so the first, I think that our that level one was, oh, I want to say, 25 trees. It wasn't a super high bar to hit for the diversity for the first level. The second level, though, I think is closer to 120 or something like that. 
but those um, the trees are marked we are working and putting together a map uh, there's um, any of the areas that we're putting in vegetation we are also planning on how to bring people to those areas as well because that's that's a key aspect with what we're doing is the mental and physical health of our employees are involved with all this um, Robert wants to know I'm getting an autumn blaze maple planted by our village staff next week is this still a good time to plant a tree it is actually fall is the preference for a good chunk of trees. Um, there's a few trees that don't particularly care for fall planting. And so red buds are one of those. Um, and some of it's just for when they're dug. Uh, but usually fall planting is actually more successful because you've had the winter to let those roots kind of adjust in. Uh, and then you get all the heavy rain in the spring. So you really put on a nice flush of growth. And as long as you keep it watered during that first summer, especially during our droughty periods, um, that's actually one of the best times to plant is in the fall. So it really gives it that nice head start. And we did have um, a previous webinar from Skeet with Bartlett Tree Care. Um, so again, if you go to that YouTube channel, he did a whole thing on planting and caring for trees. So if you do have those new trees coming in this fall or you planted some earlier this year, um, take a look at that. He talks all about, you know, circling roots and all kinds of things that you should look out for when you're picking out a tree species as well. Um, all right. And I'm, I'm assuming there is parking at your campus. If people want to walk around, there's places where people can park and, and get out. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's parking all around the campus. Um, it, the pad, there aren't dedicated paths at this time unless you go along the DuPage one that's behind Canik. Um, so it might feel a little odd just walking in the grass to see some of these areas, but you certainly are welcome to. I mean, that's what they're out there for. All right, well, thank you so much, Ani. This was really informative. You had a ton of great information there. And, and this was really cool. So we appreciate you being a part of our webinar series. And we encourage all of you to join us again next week with Bill Bedrosian to talk about ponds and stormwater basins. So thank you again, everybody. Stay safe. Have a great rest of your week, great weekend. And we will see you next time. Thanks, take care. Thank you.